Tokyo. When Yoru and I enter the cafe, Anya raises her hand to catch our attention. You're early. Sorry for calling you out here. Hey, no sweat. Um, what should we order? Don't bother with the new menu items. They're not very good. Brutal. Really? I want to apologize for yesterday, but I can't find the proper time, so I end up awkwardly biding my time. But Pacifica arrives soon enough, and after some small talk, we get to the point. Yeah, I guess as long as I apologize by the time we head out, I'm good. So this is the thing I wanted to show you guys today. Anya tosses a small, resealable bag onto the table. Ew, gross. In the bag is what appears to be a thumb-sized, oddly metallic pill bug. No, wait, it has too few legs for a pill bug. In any case, it's quite a curious creature. We found it on that corpse you took care of the other day. He had an unnatural looking wound, so I had her examine it. If your memory is accurate, Sayako, he revived a few days ago, correct? I wasn't sure if someone could get a wound like that in just a few days, you see. And what do you know? Jackpot. At first I thought it was an implant or a beacon or something, but then I thought, why would you spend that much money on henchmen sent on suicide missions? Anya picks up on Pacifica's cue. There must be something Anya knows about this thing that even Pacifica doesn't. I listen intently. This thing is, well, basically put, a soldier controller receiver. So essentially, there's a main control unit out there, someone that can manipulate dudes with this receiver implanted into them. Oh, that's not good. Controller? Main unit? Manipulate? I'm a little confused by all these video game-esque terms. It makes me think we've come a long way, both technologically and physically. I'm pretty sure I thought the same thing once before and tried to go to the outside world, yearning to go home. At first, I thought it was to ensure that their henchmen didn't go AWOL during enemy fire, but that doesn't make much sense. There are so many better ways to get people to do what you say, like special rewards. Giving away all the sweets you can eat is the way to go. So you couldn't figure it out in the end? Who do you think I am? I'm Anya, the fearless leader. Of course I looked into it. These things were used in the closing years of the Great War, when the upper brass was clearly losing command of their forces and needed to minimize the damage caused by defection. The Great War. So they tried using technology to artificially solve low morale, huh? Basically. I wonder where these guys are sending their orders from. It looks like the main unit can send or the orders do and don't. I think it works by commandeering the reward pathways of the brain and tinkering with them freely. Like how parasites can make grasshoppers badly drown themselves in a river. At least that's how I think it works. What does this mean? Well, you tell someone to do something and they must do it. Tell them don't and they must not do it. You lay down the rules. I don't know how much it'd cost to fully replace a brain with a machine. But unlike a robot or a cyborg, these soldiers can think about various aspects of their missions and can thus violate parts of their orders as long as they uphold the order overall. Now that's a blatant disregard for human rights. Yeah, I guess it beats national collapse, though. You sound like an expert. Actually, I just heard this from an acquaintance of mine who happens to be an expert. He's a man, by the way. Huh? Uh, yeah, so what? Oh my, what a lively reaction we've got here. I guess even Anya gets around, huh? Oh my god. Hey, cut it out. But what do's and don'ts were those guys told? We just don't know. Don't rat out your boss, maybe? I see, that does make sense. Guess you've got no choice but to capture the next assassin alive. Okay, I'll try. On the bright side, at least we're not dealing with gene-altering mutant manufacturing machine technology, I guess. I'd say the odds would be 50-50 in that case. 
Teenage Ninja versus Mutant would still be a tough matchup, huh? Guns. Huh? It's only 50-50 if it's an arm. And if we include guns in the mix? I chuckle knowingly. I'll leave it to you. I'm glad to see you're doing so well. That's probably thanks to my conversation with Renja. It's also thanks to the support you all give me too, of course. I feel a little guilty about not talking to anyone about my conversation with Renja. I know I could just talk about it, but considering all the effort Pacifica and Anya just went through to make me a new friend, it'd be a little rude of me to just casually mention how I made a new friend and had tea with her behind their backs. Um, I'm sorry about yesterday. Don't sweat it. It's all in the past. And thus, we plot to capture the next would-be assassin and cut him open, according to Yoru's suggestion. On the way home, she buys the sturdiest rope available at the store, just completing preparations. Wow, they buy some rope and they're good to go. But unfortunately, or should I say fortunately, we're not attacked by an assassin on the way back. The man who used the delivery man approach yesterday was supposed to be in charge of today's assassination attempt, but since he jumped the gun and died, I suppose he's taking the day off. As I think to myself and space out, the phone rings. Hello? Hello, Sayako? Sorry for calling so late. It's okay, I was still awake. Did something happen? Yeah, kind of. Can you come over to my house? Um, I take a look at Yoru to see she's dozed off while reading a book. It's a pain trying to wake her up. I really need to get her to pay more attention to the time. We'll go once I've woken up, Yoru. Oh. We'll go once I've woken up, Yoru, but that'll take a little time. No, I'd prefer if you came alone. But we don't know when the next attack will happen. It'll be fine just for tonight, I guarantee it. Anya's here already. We'll be waiting. Oh, this doesn't sound good. Okay, I'll hurry. I'm going. I pat Yoru on the forehead. I hear her mumble incoherently behind me as I head out into town. I guess this is my third time going to Pacifica's house. Since it's already late. Early? I hesitate for a moment before ringing the doorbell. But Pacifica doesn't answer. Something like this has happened before, so I wait a bit before trying again, figuring she might be using the bathroom or something. I try to simulate the situation in my head a few times to see what the best outcome would be. I feel a little happy that I've been remembering more things lately. An entire conversation plays out in my head as I wait. And yet there's no sign of Pacifica answering the door. I really hope someone didn't break into her house to settle a grudge or to steal anything. I grab the doorknob. It turns without any resistance, meaning it wasn't locked. Something's clearly wrong here. I should have done this to begin with. I barge into Pacifica's house as vigilantly as possible. There's no sign of any human, or rather, ghost presence. Instead, all that's in the living room is steaming food and coffee on the table. Normally, the smell of the food would make me hungry. But something feels ominous about this place. Someone must have broken in here after all. No, that wouldn't make sense. If I were a home invader, a table with food on it is the first thing I'd topple over. I decide to wait. Pacifica's a busy ghost, I think. Perhaps something urgent came up and interrupted her meal. Since it's cold outside, I decide to just take the coffee. Sorry for swiping the coffee. Perhaps this coffee was actually meant for me, as it's a little sweet. Oh no. I sip the coffee and sit in the sofa as I wait for the owner of the house to return. At first, I'm a little worried if there's an invader or not, but the warm room, the fluffy sofa, and the scent of Pacifica's perfume lingering on the fabric relaxes me so much. By the time I start to feel a little bored, I get struck by a bout of sleepiness. Sweet things are so relaxing, huh? Just like Pacifica. And Renja, too. I think Renja comes out on top in terms of sugar content. Pacifica's more of a natural taste. I try to get up when I start thinking weird thoughts like that, but it seems like I'm at my limit. I decide to just take a short nap. Uh-oh. 
Pacifica might be shocked to find me like this. It's a little hot. Pacifica's house has efficient heating, so I guess this is just how it gets sometimes. My eyelids feel so heavy, but I force my body to get up since I know I can't just sleep here forever. Pacifica? I open my eyes. Uh, I wish I hadn't. I want to believe that this is just a dream. I mean, I could try going back to sleep. The living room is engulfed in a sea of flames. Just about everything is on fire except for me, but it doesn't look like it'll be that way for long. I smell a faint hit of gasoline. I wonder why I didn't notice until now. The scent's way more overwhelming than the smell of burning wood, fabric, or plastic. This is arson, isn't it? But why? Wait, first things first, I gotta get out of here. With all the warning alarms going off in my head, I should have jumped out of my seat. But I don't. Huh? I can stand up, but not for long. Even if I brace my legs, the upper half of my body doesn't balance along with them. I tell my body to hold on, but the command just fizzles out before it can spread all the way. I'm frustrated, but even the frustration fizzles out. My mind goes blank. It's like I try to count to 16, but can only get to 8. I start to break out into a sweat, filling my clothes with unpleasant dampness. I need to use that displeasure as a tool to prop up my, fe my feeble concentration. When I totter over to the table, I consider placing my hands on the edge, probably due to smoke inhalation. Unfortunately, I probably can't run my way out of here. I look around. The window. If I try going out the front door, I'm almost certain I'll lose consciousness before I get there. I place my hands on the glass. I gather up all the strength I can muster and smash it. The fresh air touches my cheek. Almost there. Hang in there. Get your upper body out the window. Ugh. When my face slams into the ground, I know I've successfully escaped. I hear several footsteps in the snow. When I notice people gathering around me, I know that I've only gotten out of the fire and into the frying pan. Arson means there an ar there's an arsonist. And if there's one arsonist, why not several of them? Can you take them on? I ask myself. I don't think I can take them on. Can't you do something? I don't think I can do anything. How many are we dealing with? About three men, I suppose. Why would they gang up on a girl? Isn't it obvious? I'll kill them. Everything. You couldn't do that. Day. I'll make it happen. I take a gun out of my pocket, and without even taking proper aim, I fire at one of the men. What happens after that? Beats me. The world seems to move frame by frame, but with several frames missing. Before I realize it, I've dropped my gun. Ah, damn it. The men glare at me. My body can't move anymore. Not even my brain. I'll... them. The only thing inside of me is that single-minded intention. Time slowly drags on. The sudden sound of a siren snaps me back to my senses. The police car stops. Police! What's going on over here? A familiar-looking, plainclothes police officer shouts from the police car window. Mind explaining yourselves? When the officer tries to get out of his car, the men shoot at it. But all they get out of it is a few cracks in the windshield. Hey, you can't just shoot at a police officer like that, you know? The officer acts somewhat predictably, and then... Uh, hey ninja, sorry in advance if I hit you. He says that before firing his shotgun. I hear repeated alternation between gunshot and pump action. The stimulation overload fries my burnt out nerves, leaving me completely disoriented. Before I know it, it's just me and the officer. The other men run away. The police officer turns to me and continues. Hey, no need to be so apprehensive. I'm on your side today. Liar. I'll kill you, I swear. 
I say exactly what crosses my mind. I see. Wow, that's scary. But his casual tone of voice is nothing but proof that the danger is gone, which makes me happy and relieved. Maybe I can let my guard down just a little? And then... Ah. There's nothing little about me letting my guard down here, since I lose consciousness entirely. I wake up when I notice the characteristic rumbling of a car driving down the road. Every time the car shakes, my head aches and I curse. Hey, uh, I don't think that's appropriate language for a young girl your age. I'm lying down in the rear seat. The chief's driving, so I can't read his facial expression. Why did you save me? Well, I rushed to the scene since the house was on fire, and when I got there, I found some men ganging up on a girl. And as a police officer, it's my duty to protect and serve you. I thought you were the enemy. The chief guffaws, exhaling loudly with each ha. True, the police does have a cooperative relationship with the church, but it's not like the police's main duty is to serve the church, it's to protect the town. So it's for convenience? We want to protect the town, and if that means picking sides, we'll pick them. Um, so about the fire... We're investigating. We are. But the homeowner... Pacifica? Yeah, I think she kind of had it coming, honestly. When you live that luxuriously, you have to expect at least a little arson. Pacifica's not a bad person. That's right. Pacifica's strong, smart, well-connected, and most of all, she protects me. Well, in that case, the church isn't bad either, huh? She's not like the church. Nah. Doing business on a scale like hers while also keeping the church at bay isn't as easy as you think. You've got to do some pretty messed up stuff to manage that. That can't be the case. She's probably trying to seize control of the town away from the priest. That's what they've been saying since forever, at least. There's a side of Pacifica that I don't know, a side that I'm too afraid to know. But what I'm most afraid of is losing my trust in her. I want to believe in her. Everyone's whispering that she's seriously vying for the top spot of the food chain. She's got the strongest bodyguard in town on her side, after all. So that's what people think about my relationship with Pacifica, huh? That's not true. We're precious friends. Pacific is the one who brought me out of my room, you know? Me? The chief silently nods. Why did Pacifica bring me out of my room? Is it because she needed me? Or just anybody with great physical strength? <laughs> it can't possibly be the latter. We delivered a letter today. That's something we do every so often. We've earned a fair bit of trust, see? And? It was a letter from the church to you-know-who. Before I realize it, I'm gritting my teeth. The palm of my hands hurt, too, since I'm clenching my fists and digging my nails into my skin. My coat's moist with a strange sweat. I feel so uncomfortable, I let out a groan. What was the letter about? How should I know? We just delivered it, but I can hazard a guess. On second thought, never mind. Oh. Do I turn left? Here? Out with it. <sighs> You'll just get mad if I tell you. I can hurl you into a wall again, and I won't hold back this time. I try to be as threatening as possible, and it looks like it worked, as the chief begins to speak slowly after a short pause. I just think it's something like, if you want to join us, now's your final chance. First they form a business partnership with her, and then they seize her sympathizers. That's the usual modus operandi, isn't it? Modus operandi. That can't be right, can it? Well, that's just my take on it anyway. 
What a weird take. I don't say anything after that. My head hurts too much. The officer says something and opens the police car door. In front of me is my apartment complex. My headache's getting noticeably worse, but I make a mad dash for my room anyway. The police really is poop. All cops are poop. All cops are poop. As if I'm ever going to thank you for anything. Aw, oh, come on. See, he saved you. Say thanks. 